Slow like a merry buddy. All right. It's uh, so so great to see everybody uh, here today. Uh, we have a very special um, event and a, a guest speaker who's joined us. Very excited to you know introduce um, him. Um, before I uh, do that, uh, you know, a couple of housekeeping. Um, we, we have uh, some of our friends uh, from the uh, Ahle Sunnat community here, and since it's Ramzan, and I believe they will break their fast at uh, seven fifty-seven. Um, we'll have some refresh refreshments at the back, so anybody who has to break their fast earlier, you can go uh, to the back and uh, have some light refreshments. Uh, at 8.12, uh, we'll have our uh, azan and uh, salat, you know, about 10 odd minutes, and then we, we, we'd love all of you all to join us for iftar, and we can break uh, bread together, inshallah. Um, with that, um, I wanted to uh, take a minute to introduce our speaker. Um, many of us know uh, what's happening um, in India with, with the oppression and the fascism that's going on. What used to be a vibrant democracy is, is a democracy no more, and every day the situation in India you know, seems to be getting worse. Um, uh, there is an organization uh, that uh, you know, does what is known as Genocide Watch, um, and the founder of uh, that organization, Dr. Ellen Kennedy, uh, had a congressional briefing just you know, yesterday uh, where she said that she's seeing patterns of a holocaust in India, right? So she's seeing the patterns of a holocaust. Um, they are attacking everything from the hijab ban to everything that's sacred, um, you know, to Muslims. And it's not just the Muslims. There is a significant oppression on Christians, on uh, low, low caste Hindus, etc. It's so bad that um, if um, anyone is going through oppression and they go to the authorities to complain, um, you know, serious charges, not even like just locking them up in jail, they are levying serious charges against people who go out, you know, who go to the authorities to make a complaint. That's how bad the situation is. And no better person than Peter Friedrich, our guest speaker, to talk about the situation in India. Um, so we're excited, you know, about, um, you know, his talk. Um, I'll give you, a, you know, brief, um, you know, a background of him if you are not familiar with Peter Friedrich. Uh, he's a freelance journalist uh, specializing in analysis of current and historical affairs in South Asia. Uh, with a particular focus on the issue of Hindu nationalism. Uh, he's the author of a couple of books, uh, including The Saffron Fasces, uh, and we have copies of the books today, so if you want to pick up a copy, uh, we can have Peter sign it for you uh, during iftar time, and it's only $20, um, and we'll take cash for that. So we, we have a few copies you know, available, uh, The, the Saffron Fasces. Um, and he also has written a book called uh, India at uh, Crossroads, Hindu nationalist, nationalist Efforts to Eradicate Christianity. His uh, writings have been translated into French and uh, French, uh, Kannada, Punjabi, Spanish, Tamil. Uh, Peter, we need to add Urdu to that list, inshallah. Uh, hopefully, we'll have it translated in Urdu too. Uh, he's a frequent speaker at universities. He's also spoken alongside um, and or been cited by parliamentarians from Australia, Germany, and the United Kingdom. Uh, so without further ado, let's uh, bring up Peter Friedrich. And you can also give a loud salawat for him. Okay, thanks for coming over. Peter, in case you're not familiar, the salawat is blessings on the Holy Prophet and his family. Assalamu alaikum. Can I get a show of hands? Who knows what the RSS is? And no, I'm not talking about really simple syndication. Show of hands, RSS. You know what it is already? If you're not raising your hand right now, I hope by the end of the night that you will be able to do so. Uh, and let's put a stop to that for the moment. This is the RSS the Rashtriya Swayamsevak Song. The name stands for National Volunteer Corps. This is the RSS marching through India's southern city of Hyderabad on Christmas Day 2019. The city of Hyderabad has one of the densest Muslim populations in India. There are over 30% of the population there. 
Oh, and remember how I said this march occurred on Christmas of 2019. This march, in particular, symbolizes the RSS's agenda. It's a Hindu nationalist paramilitary, which wants to turn India into a Hindu Rashtra, that is, an exclusively Hindu nation, and it wants to eliminate Christians and Muslims from the country. The RSS is the fountainhead of Hindutva ideology. What is Hindutva? The um, United States Commission on, on International Religious Freedom says that Hindutva is an ideology which treats non-Hindus as foreign to India, treats people who are not Hindus but who live in India as being foreigners. And Amnesty International, uh, 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 similarly, uh, says that uh, Hindutva is the political ideology of an exclusively Hindu nation. It's an idea that India is, always has been, and always uh, should be and will be a country for Hindus uh, and only for Hindus. And um, it's basically synonymous with Hindu nationalism. Think Christian nationalism or Islamic nationalism or Jewish nationalism or any other religious nationalist political ideology. And just like, say, for instance, Christian nationalism, Hindu nationalism is not Hinduism. Hindutva is not Hinduism. Hindutva is propagated by what's known as the Song Paravar, uh, which is basically the family of Hindu nationalist organizations of which the RSS is the mothership. And the RSS has dozens of special interest subsidiaries. And I'm not going to get into all of them, but the most important of these are identified on this chart. Uh, here you see, and I credit Dr. Audrey Trushke of, of Rutgers for uh, creating this. Here you see the RSS as the mothership at the center. Springing out from it, you have up here on the top left, you have the VHP, Vishwa Hindu Parishad, which is the religious wing of the RSS. Uh, you have over here, bottom, bottom left, the student wing. Uh, you have over there, bottom right, the um, charitable wing. And not listed on here, but one of the most important is the youth wing of what is the religious wing, that is the VHP, of the RSS. And that youth wing of the religious wing is called the Bajrang Dal. And yes, I know it's a complicated, ridiculous uh, uh, spidery network, but it's important to understanding Hindu nationalism in India. And as you can see, all of these groups have parallel affiliates abroad. RSS has HSS. VHB has Vishwa Hindu Parishad of America. Um, and all of those groups are present, all those affiliate groups are present here in the U.S. I I'm going to get back to that, though. So the question is, just how significant um, how powerful, how influential is the RSS, or the Song Paravar, or the Song, as we'll call it for short. The RSS has an estimated six million members, and notably, that's a number that only includes members who participate in daily activities. The VHP, the religious wing of the RSS, has nearly seven million members, estimated. Well, the Bajrang Dal, the youth wing of the VHP, which is the religious wing of the RSS, has around 5 million members. Combined, they easily constitute a force surpassing 10 million or more people in India. Militants, organized militants, all with a single uh, paramilitary as their head. Now, the current chief of the RSS is Mohan Bhagwat. And since 2014, when the current government in India came into power, the RSS has grown so rapidly that Bhagwat in 2018 said, boasted, that he can prepare, uh, that the, the country, the government, can prepare um, the army uh, uh, to go to battle, go, to go to war in about six to seven months. But the RSS could field a military force within about three days. In fact, taking over India's military appears to be one of the RSS's next major goals. 
In 2019, it opened up its first army school, which is focused on training children how to become officers in the armed forces. Children who have been trained by the RSS in an RSS school with RSS ideology. In 2021, last year, Mohan Bhagwat, again the current chief of the RSS, said that he plans for the paramilitary to reach every household and to establish branches in all villages of the country by 2025. 2025 being of particular significance because it marks the paramilitary centennial anniversary. But the RSS has already reached all the halls of national political power in India. I was talking about the family of Hindu nationalist organizations, the Song Parivar, and I almost forgot to mention the Bharatiya Janata Party, the BJP, one of RSS's most important subsidiaries. It's the largest political party in the world with an estimated 180 million members. And these members include Prime Minister Narendra Modi, President Venkaiah Naidu, Home Minister Amit Shah, Home Minister who's in charge of internal law and order in the country is a member of this Hindu nationalist paramilitary. Oh, and almost 75% of all the cabinet mem members or cabinet ministers of the BJP government are members of the RSS or of one of its subsidiaries. Now in 2019, Indian author Arundhati Roy warned, and I quote, during Modi's second term, the RSS has stepped up its game. No longer a shadow state or a parallel state, it is the state. Day by day, we see examples of its control over the media, the police, the intelligence agencies. Worryingly, it appears to exercise considerable influence over the armed forces, too. Roy says worryingly. Why? What is so worrying about the RSS exerting so much influence in India? Well, the RSS is the world's oldest, largest, and fastest growing fascist organization. Founded in 1925, the same year that Hitler published Mein Kampf, his manifesto, the same year that the SS, those responsible for the Holocaust, uh, was founded. And it has a distinctly Nazi-inspired fascist ideology of its own. This is the founder of the RSS. His name is K.B. Hedgevar, or his name was K.B. Hedgevar. He's no longer with us. His mission was to organize the entire Hindu society and put into reality that this is a nation of Hindu people. Just like, in his words, Germany is a nation of Germans. Just like Germany is a nation of Germans. He said that around the 1930s, as Hitler was taking over Germany and turning it into a Nazi dictatorship. Hedgevar said that the song, the RSS, must continuously keep growing. Our goal can be achieved only if the organization grows continuously and rapidly. And the particularly menacing nature of his call to organize the entire Hindu society should not be overlooked. Because for the RSS's founders, their new paramilitary could not simply serve as an organization within the sphere of the Hindu religion but had to become the sole, solitary custodian of Hinduism itself. The RSS wants and wanted and wants to become a head of Hinduism, controlling, dictating the actions of every segment of the religion. And this vision is explicitly stated by the RSS today, which says that it wants to expand so extensively that everything related to the religion of Hinduism will be engulfed into the RSS's system. Now, this is Hedgevar on the left. He's the founder or co-founder, the first chief of the RSS. And on the right, that is M.S. Galvarkar. He's the longest serving, the most influential chief of the RSS. He served for 33 years as head of this paramilitary, from 1940 to 1973. Hedgevar founded it, but Galvarkar molded, 
influenced and articulated RSS's true ideology. He detailed his views in two manifestos, the first of which was published in 1939. What were those views? He said, referring to Indians, we are all born Hindus. Only the Hindu has been living here as a child of this soil. He said the conversion of Indians, Hindus in India, into other religions, say for instance, Christianity or Islam, is nothing but making them succumb to divided loyalty in place of having divided, undivided, and absolute loyalty to the nation. It's treason if they do it. He said the Christians and Muslims are guilty of conspiring together to break up the country. He called Christians and Muslims foreign elements, internal threats, and literally traitors. He said Muslims are rabidly anti-national and are trying to undermine our very national existence. He said Christians are bloodsuckers who will remain here as hostiles. He said Muslims and Christians should give up their present foreign mental complexion. He claimed that the only way for India to achieve national unity amongst all citizens was to fuse everybody into the Hindu way of life. He argued that every race, and he's referencing the so-called Hindu race, he argued that every race possesses the indisputable right of excommunicating from its nationality all those who, having been of the nation for ends of their own, turned traitors Turn traitors how? By converting. Turn traitors by not being a Hindu in India. Turned traitors and entertained aspirations contravening or differing from those of the national race as a whole. The foreign races in, in Hindustan, by which he means India, must either adopt the Hindu culture and language, must learn to respect and hold and reverence Hindu religion, must entertain no idea but those of the glorification of the Hindu race and culture, that it is if you're a Muslim or a Christian or some other religion living in India, you can do so if you glorify the Hindu race and culture. Must lose their separate existence to merge in the Hindu race or may stay in the country wholly subordinated to the Hindu nation, claiming nothing, deserving no privileges, far less any preferential treatment, not even citizens' rights. Now keep in mind, keep in mind that these specific comments were written in 1939. 1939 was when uh, Adolf Hitler was just launching the Second World War with the invasion of Poland. The groundwork for the Holocaust had already been laid. The whole world already knew about Hitler's genocidal intent. Now. Take a look at that uh, lower view of Galvarkar. This is his ultimate goal. Race pride at its highest has been manifested here, he says, about the groundwork that had been laid for the Holocaust in Nazi Germany. And this is a good lesson for us in Hindustan to learn and profit by, said the chief, the longest serving and most influential chief of the RSS. So. With all that, is it any surprise then that for the past 97 years of its existence, the RSS has regularly conducted assassinations, including of Mahatma Gandhi, lynchings, terrorist bombings, dozens of small-scale pogroms, and several large-scale pogroms? This is just a sample of what they've done in India over the past 97 years. So, as the RSS rules India today, what does that look like? What's it doing today, this year, this month? And a quick word of caution, none of these videos portray any violence, but uh, some of them do contain violent language and also emotionally upsetting uh, images. They're not explicit. But this one. These are all from the past four months, most from this month. This was in Delhi, the capital of the country, in December of last year. Everybody here is taking an oath to fight, die, and kill to turn India into a Hindu nation. 
This oath is being led by an RSS member who's also a prominent media personality. And play, please. Uh, yeah. This is a conference where the gentleman speaking is calling for the eradication of Islam and of Christianity. He describes Islam as a fast poison, and he says that Christianity is a slow poison. He goes on to say that Islam and Christianity should be wiped off this earth. This is um, within the past month, past few weeks, this is a rally where everybody here is taking an oath to uh, economic, economically boycott Indian Muslims. Neither will we sell them anything if they're Muslims. This is December 2021, last year. This is an open call for genocide. She is leading an oath taking, saying that they are ready to kill to reduce the population of Muslims. How many? She says they're ready to kill 20 lakh uh, Indian Muslims, 20 lakh being 2 million. And she's leading an oath for the killing of 2 million Muslims. This, I believe, was a couple of weeks ago. That is Praveen Tagodia. He is the former leader of the VHP, which is the religious wing of the RSS. He is distributing weapons and leading an oath uh, for the use of those weapons to drive Muslims out of India. This is the weapon that they're using. This is called the Trishul. This is being freely and widely distributed to millions of people throughout India. And has been used in past pogroms by the RSS. RSS rule of India also looks like militant parades dominating the streets. Here's the Bajrang Dal, the youth wing of the VHP, which is the religious wing of the RSS. I don't know about you, but if I knew that those people didn't want me as a non-Hindu living in their country, I'd be terrified having them marching by in the streets like that. RSS rule of India also looks like this, an open rape threat against Muslim women. This is outside of a mosque within the past month, I believe. This is outside of a mosque. This is this is during Ramadan, a few weeks back. This is outside of a mosque. RSS rule of India looks like mobs of hundreds or thousands of armed, probably drugged up youth, brandishing weapons outside of a mosque during Ramadan and throwing a rave. RSS rule of India also looks like gangs of Hindu nationalist thugs parading through the streets and raising the saffron flag, that is the flag of the RSS, on top of mosques. It looks like occupation. Keep in mind, this is not a one-off incident. These sorts of incidents have happened all over India in the past six months to a year. So what does all of this have to do with us? That's the question. I mean, we can see it's bad, it's horrible, and it's worrying for India, it's worrying for South Asia, it's worrying for the world from a humanitarian perspective, but also from the perspective of global stability and regional stability, with India being the second largest nation in the world, the world's largest democracy, etc. But, you know, we know injustice anywhere is a threat to justice anywhere, but does this have anything to do with the USA specifically? Remember that chart showing the Song Paravar and its network of Hindu nationalist organizations? That middle one, RSS, HSS. Take a look over there, top right, 
BJP, OFBJP. The uh, HSS stands for Hindu Swayam Sevak Song, that's the international wing of the RSS, and the OFBJP stands for Overseas Friends of the BJP, that's the international wing of the BJP, and we have them in force here in America. Video. This is the HSS marching in Houston, uh, one of their bastions, uh, just uh, a couple of years ago. Does that look anything to you like the video that we opened with of the RSS marching in Hyderabad? HSS and Overseas Friends of the BJP, they're separate organizations, but their membership is basically interlinked. Members of HSS are often members of B OFBJP, and members of OFBJP are often members of HSS. Uh, that's Ramesh Butada from Houston, where that march took place. He's the vice president of uh, HSS USA, but he's also an active participant in the Overseas Friends of the BJP. When Modi was first elected prime minister in uh, 2014, the OFBJP was crucial. They provided him a huge help. They mobilized hundreds. Actually, across all networks in the US, they mobilized probably as thousands, maybe even as many as 5,000 people to travel from this country to India to go campaign for Modi, to get him elected. Many of these were US citizens. Now think of it this way. Imagine if thousands of Americans had moved to Russia, renounced their US citizenship, and become Russian citizens. Now imagine if during America's 2020 presidential election, thousands of those American expatriates who had given up their citizenship traveled back to America to go around our country campaigning for a certain political party. Wouldn't we be outraged? Wouldn't we consider it as foreign interference in our sovereign elections? Well, that's what's happening with India. And it's happening from here. The OFBJP, the Overseas Friends of the BJP, started very early. You can see this is dated 2011, organizing in Houston training camps to teach people in America how to go back to India to campaign for the BJP to get Modi elected. And there was a massive uh, push, a huge mobilization. Um, you know, aside from the thousands volunteering with the OFBJP to travel from America to India to campaign as boots on the ground, serve as campaign workers, there were huge phone banks in America working around the clock, they say, to call people, call Indians from the U.S. and tell them, oh, I'm calling from the U.S. and I'm calling to tell you in India who to vote for. Uh, it was uh, such a massive under undertaking that Ramesh Butada, the vice president of the HSS, the international wing of the RSS, uh, says it was like organizing an Indian wedding. Now, after Modi was elected, the OFBJP continued operating in um, the U.S. as a PR machine, as a propaganda mouthpiece to promote Modi, the BJP, and internationalist policies in India. They do this by organizing protests in the streets, pressuring American lawmakers not to talk about human rights in India, and so on. They also um, worked, the OFBJP and the HSS have worked to help build up Modi among the Indian American community. They promote him in the diaspora by bringing him over here and throwing rock star receptions for him, the last of which was Howdy Modi in Houston in 2019. It's a chance for Modi to pay back everything he owes to the American song groups who were so crucial to getting him elected. It's also a chance for him to build up his propaganda machinery here in America. And it was a massive uh, event. There were about 50,000 people that came out to this Howdy Modi in Houston, uh, this rock star reception for Modi, who was formerly banned, uh, actually, uh, from entering this country before he became Prime Minister of India. It was huge. And President Trump was there. Now, before you play this short video, please pay attention to what, um, what uh, Modi is saying to Trump.
Now that didn't turn out so well, but Ab Ki Bar Trump Sarkar, for those of you who don't know, essentially means once more the Trump regime. Uh, keep in mind that at this time Trump was running for re-election. This was 2019. Uh, this was essentially a foreign leader visiting America, standing alongside our president who's running for re-election and issuing a partisan endorsement for his re-election. Now, uh, a few months later, open threat of foreign interference in our elections as the uh, BJP leader, top leader, threatened uh, after uh, Bernie Sanders running for president, uh, criticized uh, the Indian government, the Modi government for, the, for its role in the February 2020 Delhi pogrom, this BJP leader openly threatened foreign interference in our elections. If all that sounds a bit suspicious, well, I guess the US government thought so too. Because in 2020, uh, after nearly 30 years of operation in our country, the OFBJP was compelled to register as a foreign agent after it worked from America to, uh, to get Modi elected in India, and after it organized a rock star reception for Modi in America where Modi endorsed our then sitting president for re-election, finally they were compelled to register. Well, before they registered, um, they had interactions uh, with a number of different politicians in our country. One of them to whom they were particularly close was uh, now former Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard. Uh, here she is in 2014 on the left at a OFBJP banquet celebrating uh, Modi's election. And she's posing at the time with the international chief of the overseas friends of the BJP. And a, what's she wearing? She's wearing, she's wearing the BJP colors. She's wearing a BJP uh, emblazoned scarf. There she is at an HSS event. Oh, and there she is, that's her wedding, and the gentleman uh, on, the, on the right there, that happens to be the uh, vice president of the HSS, the international wing of the RSS, at her wedding. But Tulsi Gabbard's not alone. We also have uh, actually current congressman, Raja Krishnamurti from Chicago. And uh, there he is at an event, an HSS event, and not just any HSS event, but one that was actually organized to celebrate the founding of the RSS. And notice those pictures behind Congressman Krishnamurti. That one, right there with the yellow flowers. Does he look familiar? That's Golvarkar, the longest serving and most influential chief of the RSS. And what did Golvarkar say? Oh yeah, Golvarkar called the groundwork for the Holocaust, race pride, manifest at its highest and said it was a good lesson to learn and profit by. Is that what Krishnamurti stands for? Now, I could go on about other politicians, but as I wrap this up, since we're here in San Jose, California, the San Francisco Bay Area, let me bring this a little closer to home. Here we have Saratoga City Councilor Rishi Kumar, who is also running for US Congress. And here he is at a Bay Area event in 2019, I believe this was Milpitas. Um, this event was hosted for the specific purpose of working to get Modi reelected. And what is this gentleman who is a city councilor in America, who's running for US Congress, what's he wearing? He's wearing a BJP scarf. He's endorsing a foreign political party. And not just any foreign political party, but one which is the political wing of the world's largest, oldest, and fastest growing fascist movement. Well, this comes even closer to home. We're here at the Saba Islamic Center, and the congressional rep for this district, this ground we're standing on right now, is Congressman Ro Khanna. Ro Khanna is a Hindu. Ro Khanna is also a Hindu who understands the evils and dangers of Hindu nationalism, of Hindutva. So, because he does, in 2019, Congressman Ro Khanna took a stand. He said that it is the duty of every American politician of Hindu faith to reject Hindutva. It was a bold, a courageous, and a principled stand. And what happened? Rokana's stand against Hindutva caused the HSS and the OFBJP members here in the Bay Area, in this 
city in this congressional district to prop up a pro hindutva candidate to try and steal Rokana's seat in the U.S. Congress. This gentleman on the far left is Ritesh Tandon. He ran for Congress against Ghana and lost in 2020. Here is what he proudly boasted about. Uh, he boasted about his father's RSS credentials. He boasted about how he was motivated to run for Congress. The, his primary motivation to run for Congress was Congressman Ro Khanna's anti-Hindutva comments. Oh, and importantly, who are these other people with Ritesh Tandon, who's a candidate for US Congress? And this is while he's on the campaign trail. Uh, on the right is Chandru Bambra, a former president of the Overseas Friends of the BJP, which is now a registered foreign agent in America. And in the center is Sambit Patra, an official spokesperson of the BJP, of India's BJP. He's an Indian politician from the BJP. These gentlemen are posing here with a candidate for US Congress who's on the campaign trail. Now, there's so much more that we could discuss, but for tonight, the real question is, what can we do? What can you do? Quickly? We can get informed, and I recommend getting informed by reading my book. It's an excellent primer on the topic of Hindu nationalism and what's happening in India, what the Hindu nationalist goals are, what the RSS is. Talk to your neighbors. Contact our congressional representatives, including people like, since we're here in Rokana's district, Congressman Rokana. Organize more events like this and more often because the stakes have never been higher. There's an impending genocide, and I say that with no exaggeration or hyperbole whatsoever. There is an impending genocide of Indian Muslims and other minorities in India that is going on right now. Thank you. Well, that was uh, very um, informational. I'd love to have had more time uh, with uh, Peter. Um, in fact, we, wa we wanted to see if he could do a Q&A, but there's other programs lined up, so we'd love to invite him back. Peter, we'd love to have you come back uh, you know, for another event in the near future. Um, uh, Peter has been doing tre tremendous work, so please try to follow him on, on Twitter, on, on the other social media channels, um, and also subscribe to his, uh, his email list. He has a very nice email distribution list with uh, you know, updates, etc. I encourage everyone to go to his website, peterfriedrich.com, and, and, and sign up for his email list. Uh, and uh, you know, please keep him in your best wishes.